Peter, you're on mute. Okay, everybody, as our uh, attendee number settles down, I think we can get started. Um, greetings and welcome to today's DASH webinar about the mentorship program. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Peter Eckert. I'm the co-director of Data Across Sectors for Health, and uh, I'll be kicking off the webinar. Next slide, please, Susan. So we're doing today's webinar over Zoom so that we could see us, we could see you and you could see us, particularly when we get to the point when the mentors are doing their, their uh, pitches, um, you'll be able to see the mentors themselves. So uh, you will be able to raise your hand. Um, you will be able to submit questions in the chat. And so you can see on the bottom of the screen, if you're not already painfully familiar with Zoom, um, that's how that works. Next slide. Uh, by the way, the slides uh, are and will be available. And so I'm going to zoom through the ones at the top here because I only have three and a half minutes left. So we're going to do a quick introduction to DASH and All In, spend most of the time on the DASH mentorship program, including the mentor pitches, and then get to your questions and answers, as many as we can get to. Questions not answered during this session will be available at the mentorship program link, and we'll reference that multiple times. Next slide, please. So um, Data Cross Sectors for Health, hopefully you know about us already. We are a partnership between the Illinois Public Health Institute and the Michigan Public Health Institute, a program office of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation now in our sixth year of operation. Next slide. <clears throat> um, we focus on the multiplicity and diversity of data that describes health um, both individual and collective. And so not just what happens at hospitals or in public health departments, but housing, education, public safety, social services, and of course, um, recognizing leadership and voice of community residents. Next slide, please. In all of its work uh, at, um, at DASH, we've always been focused on the same stuff. We are interested in multi-sector approaches. So that's all the stuff on the previous slide um, around community collaborations uh, that are sharing data information. And so everything is focused on improving health, uh, well-being, and equity. Um, we have always followed these three strategies, build local capacity, build the evidence base based on um, what we learn from our grantees and build a national movement to advance uh, health, well being, and equity. Um, this both informs an approach to policy and systems change, and then policy and systems change uh, in turn strengthens all three of our strategies. And so the mentorship program is really strongly focused on building local capacity but it also addresses some of the ele other elements here too. Um, let's jump up to slide number 10, Susan, just to keep on track. <clears throat> uh, the primary network for uh, participating in the mentorship program um, is all in data for community health. Um, that slide uh, is old. We're up to really closer to 250 community collaborations by the time we select the mentors will be close to 300. And so seven national and state-based partners, all of whom are focused on health, well-being, and equity, have banded together to create one big learning collaboration. Uh, Dash says all the time that we believe that um, different communities can inform the experiences, can learn from, can teach each other. We say the wisdom is in the room. And so all in is becoming a very big room. Next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, even though the mentorships are a DASH program, we operate within the all in learning network. And so uh, the work that will be described by Anna Barnes in a second, um, is, is uh, specific to DASH, but it draws on all of these elements of the All-In Learning Network. We do a lot of publications. A lot of you are probably already familiar with our online community. We support and staff uh, peer visiting. We do lots of webinars. 
We have a great newsletter. Uh, the to this month's episode or issue just went out today, and then we also convene lots of meetings, including the virtual meeting uh, that we just finished last month. So All In is a vibrant and exciting uh, community, and whether you are funded or not um, for the mentorship program, you will find lots of support and encouragement for multi-sector community-based data sharing there. And with that, I want to turn it over to Anna Barnes, who has been leading and iterating on the mentorship program since we started it um, over three years ago. Anna. Great, thanks, Peter. So I'm Anna Barnes, um, she, her, I'm a program director at the Illinois Public Health Institute on the DASH project. Um, so this is our third year, our third round of launching the mentorship program. We have made some great improvements um, in collaboration with the mentors and feedback from past mentees. Um, so generally here, it, the purpose of our program is to support early stage multi-sector collaborations. So when you apply, you're applying as a team um, of at least two organizations. There's one exception. There's a couple mentee slots um, for mentees just with one organization for United Way, but the vast majority, if not all, will be um, partnerships of two or more up to four organizations working together. Um, this, this illustration here, I think is a really great depiction that my colleague Susan found for us. A lot of these pieces are encompassed in our mentorship program, particularly training, um, coaching, support, and then that kind of inspires motivation and success. So I think that's a really good um, snapshot right there. Let's go to the next slide. So here, um, I just wanted to give you sort of a side-by-side -side look at sort of how the DASH National Program Office works in collaboration with the mentors. And when, if you're an applicant or selected as a mentee, when to expect contact with our team versus with the mentor. So, the program office um, will host cross cohort meetups for all the mentees and all the programs. Um, we will also be your main point of contact for the financing and the contract, as well as for the closing evaluation. We participate in the um, cross in the cohort webinars or learning activities that the mentors will host for you. Um, and then we work directly with the mentors. So the mentors will be your day to day point of contact. Um, these are seasoned and experienced um, organizations from across the country that have work, been working with DASH for many years. Um, we, they'll be leading you through one-on-one -on -one coaching, through calls, technical assistance. They also offer tailored training and point you to specific resources. They'll be hosting cohort meetups or one-to-one -one calls between your team and another team. And then really the foundation, this cross-cutting piece is the all in learning collaborative that Peter spoke to. The most important thing to remember about that is that it's, it's really just a broader network, a larger community of practitioners that you can um, leverage to advance your work. Next slide. So um, this is just an example of some of the things that the mentors did last year or men and mentees. Um, there's been a lot of cross-pollination of um, speakers, and then you can see here, mentees create a work plan and then report out on the progress that they've made. So lots of success. Next slide. Um, this is a new thing we're gonna offer for Mentor 3.0, these cross cohort webinars. This is just some proposed ideas and topics based on the expertise we know the mentors have. Um, cross sector partnerships, stakeholder buy-in, um, you can see the list here. Next slide. So just at a glance, we will be awarding up to 45 contracts um, for seven cohorts. So there's seven mentors that you'll be meeting um, momentarily. Each mentor has a different focus area, but as you can see with those cross-cutting topics, there is a lot of overlap of um, content that's covered by, by different mentors. Um, the awards will be between five and ten thousand dollars, depending on how many organizations you you have participating. And the idea is that you would then distribute or disperse the funds among your partners. Um, we pay the bulk of the contract up front and the last ten percent when the final evaluation is submitted. It's a nine or ten month program, 
The applications are due January 22nd. We review them in February and then the program starts in March and closes out in December. Next slide. So I'm not gonna read through all of these and you can find all of this information in the program brochure, but I just wanna kind of highlight a couple things with the eligibility criteria and then the selection criteria. So for eligibility, um, you must have a cl clear purpose or goal of you know, what you're hoping to do by participating in the program. You need two organizations. So the lead organization counts as one, and then the second organization that's a partner from a different sector. Um, you may have up to four. You need to be a nonprofit or a public entity like a government agency. Um, and those are really, the, and you have to be based in the, the US or territories. Next slide. So I think this just kind of outlines a little bit more about the distinction about which eight types of sectors that partners can come from um, and that there's an interest in you know, working together, even if the, the partnership doesn't have to be long standing, but there has to be an expressed intent in working together on a, a multi-sector project. Next slide. So selection criteria are those pieces that elevate your application um, to the round of finalists. So some of these things have to do with, um, you know, how well you demonstrate your past experience, what your goals are, um, if you've been working together and have a clear plan of what your next steps are, the variety of sectors represented, how clear and responsive um, the proposal is to the questions. And then really, can you articulate why you think you need some coaching and guidance either from the mentor and or you know, the broader peer learning cohort? Next slide. So more on the, um, okay, yeah, we can pause here. You submit your, the application is meant to be relatively low lift. Um, it's through Survey Gizmo. There are, is an option to submit supplemental documents, including letters of support, as well as like a draft work plan. The work plans will be finalized for the selected mentees. Um, and I think the, I think that that's it. I think we, we got through the high level pieces here. Um, and this is just an overview again of the, the key dates that we explained. Next slide. I don't think I mentioned you can apply for up to two mentorships. So when you're when you're listening to these pitch um, pitches coming up, think about you know which men mentors seem like they're the best best fit for your team. Um, if you need any guidance on that, you're welcome to reach out to us for suggestions as well. So with that, I'm going to pass it over now to Karis Grounds from San Diego 211. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karis Grounds, and I am with 201 San Diego's Community Information Exchange, and um, we'll be kind of running through our mentor pitch. We're so excited to be able to, this is, I think, third year mentoring, um, and um, we've had such a wonderful time with our mentees, and so we'll kind of talk about what um, infrastructure we have in place to be able to um, have our mentors, our mentees. So you go to the next slide. This is a little bit about who we are. So we are a local 211 um, in San Diego, Imperial area. And um, we are a nonprofit organization that is really leveraging our local experience to help educate other communities about what, what, what's working and what's not working. So um, traditionally 201s, as you know, we have United Worldwide on the call as well. Um, you know, we worldwide to explain a little bit about more about two on ones and their relationship. Um, but two on ones are traditionally known for information and referral. And um, we in San Diego were able to really expand on our traditional two on one and build a community information exchange is really a place where we're the nexus between um, health and human services and providing information to those services to those agencies and really leveraging that infrastructure to be able to do the work. So if you go to the next slide, um, as we were moving as a two-on-one organization into more person-centered care, as we were thinking about how do health and social services really interact with one another, and as more organizations are learning about social determinants of health, 
we um, were looking at 201 San Diego and within San Diego, um, like the, the image on the left, and really how do we move more towards the image on the right that looks at person-centered care? I think that's right and left. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, maybe on your screen, it's different, but you know what I'm saying. So basically trying to put the person at the center and how do we really coordinate the care and services around that person um, from an equitable and inclusive way. So if you move to the next slide, um, we are a team of um, three. So myself, um, I have a background in public health. Beth Johnson, um, who is really uh, focuses on like strategic initiatives and worked at Academy Help before. And then Cami Christensen, who has a background in social work, really leveraging our subject matter expertise, our local experience, and, um, and our mentorships um, previously to be able to really support organizations that are trying to develop a community information exchange and what it means to do that, what are the components that take that it takes to be able to do that. And this team really helps, um, we help to guide organizations in kind of like, what infrastructure do you need? What are best practices to be learned? And how do we create an environment where we can kind of push some of the concepts and ideas around data sharing and cross-sector collaboration forward? So if we go to the next slide. Um, so really our three main focus areas um, are around gaining a foundational understanding of a CIE model. So what does it mean to have a CIE? What are the core components? Making sure that you have an approach with identifying the right um, partners, making sure you have the buy-in and the shared vision around a community information exchange. So really looking at how do um, we create a shared infrastructure to share information, um, ensuring that the person's at the center. And then really think about um, resident engagement, community member engagement, um, making sure that community voice is at the core center forefront of what we're trying to do and sharing information across sectors. And so that's really the policies, the shared governance infrastructure that the core needs you need to be able to do that. And if you go to the next slide, um, CIEs, we are, um, we think about, about CIE as kind of like a continuum. And so organizations might be at different stages of it. Um, traditionally, I think community information exchanges might be attributed to like referral, um, referrals, like being able to make a referral across health and social services. And so um, that is a piece of it, but it's really about shared informed care. And so we have a kind of different phases of what building a CIA might look like. And all of you as mentees might be at a different phase of that. And our goal is really to help, um, help identify where you're at and then what um, infrastructure or capacity or partners you need to bring all on board or community members you need to bring on along board to be able to really move um, your community um, up more towards like a more community care planning model that's actually um, a, sh a shared infrastructure and a shared governance within your community. And so if you go to the next slide, the way that we, um, our approach is really kind of a human-centered design um, and equity approach. And so here are some of the examples of the way that we design because we believe that what we're doing with the CIA is really around systems change. So really changing the way that organizations are collaborating with one another, really changing the way that we're providing services to individuals within the community, and then um, really looking at data um, and informing the way that we um, provide services and connect people to services in the community. So these are just some of the core components that we will address through our um, mentorship, but um, just helpful to kind of gather um, those different ways that we are, we're thinking about it and how to, how to structure a CIE. And if you move to the next slide, um, our approach through mentoring is kind of a whole bunch of different ways. Um, we have, um, and Anna kind of announced the new way that we're thinking about doing kind of shared learning opportunities, but we also have monthly shared learning webinars where we're really focusing on, we have a whole bunch of resources and webinars available right now where you can, and we have a toolkit um, that's already published and some different briefs on some of the ways that CIEs have been leveraged across the nation. So we have some existing tools, but our monthly meetings and one-on-one -on -one coaching really allows for organizations for new trends or information around what, what works or what might you might be struggling with within your own community. We can share lessons, learn best practices, peer learning, um, some of the core components that often come up around data sharing, data use agreements. We recently just published um, our data use agreement that we leverage internally, um, legal frameworks, privacy, security, technology, sustainability, all the kind of core components that 
um, the governance model, how do we include community members, all those are pieces of and discussions that we talk about in our monthly meeting. We often present those and have opportunities for organizations to share those. And then we have one-on-one -on -one supports where we actually work locally with your organization and potentially the partners that you're working with to help support you through that, um, through building towards a community information exchange. What infrastructure do you need or capacity or conversations or kickoff meetings or tools might be helpful for you to, to kind of move you on that journey towards the top level of a CIE. And if you go to the next slide, um, so these are, here's some benefits. I know I'm probably running out of time, so I'm gonna be really, really fast, but here are some benefits of partnering with us. Again, we are, we're living, we're learning and breathing this all in the same moment. So we are literally implementing a CIE and we already had a CIE for a long time. So lessons learned, we learn in real time, we share with our mentors. So I think that, or our mentees, so which is kind of cool. So with COVID-19, we like would share what we were learning and could that be adopted within communities? And we're very responsive to what, what's happening locally um, with the current infrastructure of health and social, kind of social determinant of health interventions in general. So there's a lot of ways to leverage what we're doing and learn from one another within these um, sessions. And we learn a lot too, because we're learning from all of you about what's working and what's not working or new things we should share or um, new ways to kind of think about things. So it's kind of a, a shared learning environment. And if you go to the last slide, who should join us? So um, we often look at more mature nonprofit organizations or healthcare organizations that have already have referral capacity, um, some data exchange capacity or actively developing a technical infrastructure. So we want to make sure it's a community led project. We do believe, you know, sometimes um, that the infrastructure needs to be led and developed within the community and have community members engaged. So if you're interested in adopting that type of model and really thinking about equity and inclusion as your first and foremost kind of approach, those type of um, mentees would be should should join should be interested in in um, joining our mentorship. Also, if you already have um, maybe buy-in or cross stakeholders that are interested in kind of implementing um, a community information exchange and looking at developing a shared infrastructure. Um, and you have existing relationships outside of your organization, we really love to support communities that are kind of at the forefront or starting to build these relationships or have some activity across sectors that are that's already kind of brewing. And so we can come in and really help you guys kind of move to the next level, um, identify ways to kind of get your community to, to move towards a CIE. So did I do that in time? I don't know. I didn't really breathe much, but yes, thank you. Join our mentorship, yay. So am I good to just start yep. going with the Corporation for Supportive Housing? All right, thanks. Uh, and we can just go straight to the next slide. Cool. Uh, so my name is Gabe Schusser. I'm really excited to introduce the mentorship for the Corporation for Supportive Housing or just CSH. Uh, this is also going to be our third year doing the mentorship. Uh, we can go back to that previous slide, uh, please. Um, and I think that it's going to be probably the, the best year yet on account of everything that we've learned through the process. To provide a little bit of context about uh, who we are, uh, CSH is an organization uh, that sits at the forefront of supportive housing uh, in sort of the housing and healthcare and multi-sector field. Uh, we're not direct service providers. Instead, we work to engage vital public systems to adopt supportive housing and hopefully allow for the shift of public resources. Um, sort of central to all of that is this idea of systems change, which is a reorganization or reorientation of administrative systems so that they can operate and work together um, and an essential component of providing the best outcomes for our country's most vulnerable individuals and families. Uh, and we can jump to the next slide. So for our 2021 mentorship, uh, our team is made up of the CSH data and analytics team. Uh, so from left to right, that is our colleague Ian Costello, uh, Kim Keaton, who is also on the call and will be talking a little bit later in our presentation, and then uh, myself on the right, Gabe Schuster. Next slide, please. 
So before we get into some of the real details of our specific mentorship, I wanted to cover a couple of key terms uh, that really frequently come up in our work. The first is HMIS. Uh, usually this is just presented as an acronym. It does actually mean something. It means a uh, homeless management information system. It's a broad term that refers to a whole class of databases that are used to aggregate data about homeless persons. Uh, they maintain confidentiality for clients and they log interactions with the system, whether that's during street outreach or in a shelter and so on. Uh, next up is a continuum of care. So uh, COC is the jurisdiction that oversees the administration of housing and services for homeless families and individuals within their geography. Uh, they're usually managed independently from local government. So you might be working in a community, your community might be part of a COC that is covers you know, your community as well as others within your state. Uh, next is a coordinated entry system. A uh, coordinated entry system is designed to identify people in housing crisis and connect them to assistance based on their needs. Uh, so a well-functioning coordinated entry system does an assessment on individuals or families so that they can be really efficiently connected to the correct housing and service interventions. Uh, data matching is a process by which multiple data sets that have identifiable data in them are compared against one another so that you can match unique individuals uh, that show up in different systems. Uh, and lastly, data integration is the result of ongoing data matching. It's how we describe a system that is set up uh, with the right data and the right tools such that multiple administrative data sets can talk to one another uh, and the results are funneled to key decision makers in the community. Next slide. So why should we be interested in sharing data across housing and health systems? Uh, the phrase housing as healthcare has become more and more common, and there's growing evidence base supporting the notion that improved housing outcomes translate into improved health outcomes. And this is true at the individual level, it's also true at the population level. Uh, but if homelessness systems and health systems are working in isolation from one another, neither system can live up to its potential in terms of achieving the best possible outcomes for clients. So sharing data across housing and health systems or other systems like jail or child welfare, we work with sometimes, uh, can lead to stronger partnerships across sectors. And then by identifying clients that frequently utilize these systems, we can do a better job of targeting and prioritizing resources. Uh, all this raises the question, you know, how do we actually get to the point of sharing data? So there's this alphabet soup of acronyms that often stands in the way of people trying to get through this and can confuse and obfuscate the process, whether that's data sharing agreements, data use agreements, business associate agreements, and so on. Uh, as part of our mentorship, we're going to focus on how to build cross-sector relationships that work towards identifying and implementing the right kinds of agreements and systems to facilitate data sharing. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague, Kim Keaton, who's gonna talk about some of the use cases for data sharing in terms of high utilization and coordinated entry. Thank you. Um, it's, so one of the, the main sort of concerns that we hear from going back, yeah, thank you, um, from the healthcare sector is, the high utilization of crisis, what we call crisis care services, um, that uh, people who are without homes, so maybe living on the street, um, don't have access to things that would help control their conditions like refrigerators and a safe way to keep medication and things like that, um, that really um, cause folks to go in and out of various systems that could be healthcare, that could also be uh, jails, that could be uh, psychiatric inpatient, uh, substance use treatment facilities, et cetera, with really, really poor outcomes. Um, housing interventions that are based on matched data across these systems and then targeted at folks that are really proven to really be on that cycle um, help to break that cycle while uh, increasing housing stability and reducing multiple crisis uh, service use. And, um, you know, CSH has been at working with communities all over the country for about 12 years on something we call FUSE, which is Frequent User Systems Engagement. And that really uh, is, a, is a planning framework for 
um, putting together these data systems, matching data, and then figuring out what those targeted interventions might be. Next slide. Um, I think that Gabe set us up nicely with some terms earlier. Um, we have something called coordinated entry. Um, I know I saw, I was looking in the chat. Um, I saw a lot of folks from all over the country and I, I, chances are some of you, particularly those of you in the United Ways, either are part of your continuum of care or uh, are participating in coordinated entry, or maybe you even run the continuum of care in some way. Um, coordinated entry is a process that HUD mandates by uh, which communities must, you know, sort of create a level playing field for people entering the homeless system. Um, one of the things that is interesting about coordinated entry for the purposes of the DASH mentor, mentorship is that high utilization of crisis services based on matched administrative data is an allowable criteria for prioritization of these limited housing resources that are available through homeless continuum of care. And so there's a real incentive um, provided to us through guidance provided by HUD and uh, and actually starting to really be proved in systems uh, and communities across the country where they're looking at data feeds from uh, different systems and using those feeds and the prior and the utilization that we find from there uh, to bump people further up on the list that may be more vulnerable, maybe sicker, maybe, um, you know, maybe uh, more in need of housing than others, um, given that it's a limited resource. And so, you know, with fully, with more integrated data, the better picture you can paint uh, of both individuals and your community's general needs for housing and service interventions. Next slide. You're on mute still, Gabe. Still on mute, Gabe. There we go. Yeah, I just saw the host muted me, it said. Uh, can folks hear me now? Okay. Uh, so one last element that I wanted to raise up as part of our mentorship is um, how communities use data from public agencies and through data sharing to address racial disparities as they show up across sectors. Uh, so CSH in the past year has begun using uh, racial disparities and disproportionality index uh, which is a methodology that we've pushed out that lets communities assess disparities across sectors and to assess disparities in outcomes within service populations. Um, so through our mentorship, we'll also be taking a look at how communities can leverage the data that they collect uh, and share in order to identify and then hopefully address disparities within their systems. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, so last piece, I just wanted to lay out a little bit of what uh, our mentorship really looks like. Um, so we hope to guide our mentees through the data sharing process, you know, across complex administrative systems and ultimately to work towards implementing active data matching projects. Um, so we think about that really broadly, not just in terms of, you know, applying a data matching tool but developing relationships, uh, thinking through legal obstacles, and then strategic planning that comes out of integrated data. Um, our mentorship will have a lot of opportunities to um, have peer-to-peer -peer learning across our mentee group, uh, and then also to start thinking through, you know, what different resources are available, um, either through HUD or through other systems that um, make data sharing easier uh, within communities and hopefully to build towards a plan that includes data sharing as a final goal. Um, ultimately, you know, we want to help communities establish frameworks that they need in place to begin sharing data. Um, you know, mentees that we've had in the past have done all sorts of really interesting projects from uh, establishing data warehouses to link homeless data across COCs. They've connected spatial data on opioid crisis resources to uh, connect it with homeless street outreach data. And they've built integrated systems to connect utilization data for uh, centralized service centers. Uh, so some really interesting opportunities there. I think the mentees that 
have been really successful with us have been those that have a clear sense of uh, who the community partners that they intend to work with are, have a good sense of you know, what data it is that they intend to use um, and have partnerships sort of in the works uh, where it's clear that that data is going to be accessible. Uh, and that's all that I have. I just wanted to thank Dash again for the opportunity to share this out with the broader audience and looking forward to working with folks in the future. Hi everyone. My name is Bentley Moses, and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Center for Outcome Research and Education's um, DASH mentorship. Um, I'm also joined by Stacey DeLong, and um, we will be presenting together today. Next slide. So CORE is an independent research evaluation and analytics team focused on improving the health of communities. So we strive to um, understand and illuminate how healthcare, social services, and life experiences intersect <laughs> to affect the health of individuals and communities. Getting a little bit of feedback, I wonder if folks can make sure they're muted. Thank you. So our research and program evaluation and data science work are all designed to provide essential information to help policy uh, uh, and system decision makers. Um, so we're based in Portland, Oregon. Um, we've been working on the DASH mentorship program for the last three years and really enjoy working with folks across the country on a variety of different projects. Next slide. So our team um, brings a focused expertise on cross-section of people, data, and action. So looking at all of those pieces, um, we focus on designing data strategies to meet the needs of communities. We're excited by new challenges. Um, we really like problem solving. We're very nimble, flexible, and we have a practical style of work. So um, we work well with people through all sorts of transitions in their work, changes, um, expected and unexpected. So the three folks that you can expect to work with are Hannah Cohen Klein. Um, she is our program director and research scientist at CORE. Um, and then Stacy DeLong, um, she's the program director of analytics. And myself, Bentley Moses, um, I'm the program manager within analytics. So between us, we've got a diverse uh, portfolio of experience for research, evaluation, um, analytics, and program design. Next slide, please. So Stacy is going to talk a little bit about our mentorship and sort of CORE's main areas of expertise. Oh, Stacey, if you're speaking, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you go ahead, um, two slides, I think? Next slide, there we go. Um, so with our mentorship, um, what we are helping our mentees to achieve are these objectives. We work with our mentees to define use cases. This is really about helping you clearly defining, concisely describe how you plan to use data, for what purposes, we help our mentees develop a data strategy, and this is really about identifying the choices, decisions, processes, stakeholders, actions you're going to take to help reach your goals. Um, mentees identify approaches to share and govern data. Um, this is about helping you understand the paths to sharing data, what types of DUAs or MLUs or agreements you'll need in place, and how you're going to govern data that as you start sharing it. Um, we're, we're looking to work with mentees who want to understand how to use cross-sector data for planning, policy decisions, evaluation, and research. Um, we'll cover topics that come up related to analyses, data solutions and storage, communication, stakeholder engagement, and more. Um, we're not a good fit for projects related to real-time information exchange, but if you're looking to share data for these purposes, um, we tend to be a good fit. Um, next slide. Um, so this is a general framework we use to work with our mentees on developing a data strategy and we structure our mentorship topics, information and resources around this framework. These are some of the things we'll cover related to defining purpose, engaging stakeholders, securing resources, governing data sharing and use, identifying technical solutions, acquiring and analyzing data, and then publishing and communicating data. 
Next slide, please. So we provide a variety of supports for mentees. Um, we uh, host workshops. These are essentially con content sessions and trainings um, that we'll either host as real-time group meetings or webinars or post to an on the online all-in community. In the past, we've tailored these sessions to align with our mentees' priorities. Um, so the content may shift depending on what the mentees are focusing on. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one calls with mentees where mentees can share questions, agenda items, and materials um, that they that they want to cover. Um, we tend to have action periods, so essentially uh, we'll we'll identify action items for mentees to work on in accordance with their work plans. Um, and then mentees will work on those using tools and resources and we can provide guidance for that work. Uh, we'll provide tailored tools and resources directly to mentees and then um, we'll facilitate shared learning through pooled knowledge, learning and ideas via tools, resources, and the online community. Next slide, please. So here's some things our past mentees have achieved. We're in our third round, as Bentley mentioned, as the DASH, Dash mentor. And some of the things that our partners have done in the past is secure partner buy-in um, by articulating clear vision and goals, mm. defined data use cases and subsequent data indicators, secured funding, um, identified a consent process to allow data access and data sharing, developed shared metrics with their partners, and built academic and government partnerships. Next slide. Um, so thanks for this opportunity today. We're really hoping to get to meet you and work with you in the future. Hi, I'm Kaylee McMonagall and I'm a collaboration manager with the Civic Canopy. You can go ahead and do next slide. So who we are, we're based out of Denver, Colorado, and we are a nonprofit focused on creating the conditions where the many work as one for the good of all. If you'd pop back for just a second. Um, and uh, within that mission, we are an organization that has served as a backbone for a number of collective impacts efforts throughout the state of Colorado. Um, and we've shifted our priorities as an organization rather than providing that as a service to actually switch to uh, uh, building capacity within other organizations to serve as that backbone entity. So I saw some folks interested in collaborative impact or community impact sort of work. And that's part of where our expertise comes into it. And uh, while this shows our whole team, we're a small team. Uh, myself and Bill Fulton, our executive director, are the primary mentors on this project. Next slide. So our general approach is to work on uh, efforts in three, three areas to build relationships, develop capacity. Oh, one slide back. Develop capacity and catalyze action. So we're constantly thinking about not only um, individual collective impact networks, but how we can create networks of networks that allow data to transfer, but also action that results in uh, different health outcomes for communities. We're always focused on a transfer of capacity, which works well for a mentorship program, so that by the end of it, you feel confident in your ability to take on those skills on your own. And we want to be really action focused, so not data for the sake of data, but making sure that we're using it in ways that gets to real results. Next slide. Throughout this work, we use this community learning model that really, you see results at the center here, but it's focused on all of these different pieces uh, that support not only the identification of results, but the ability to achieve those. So the first piece of this is inclusion. How are you making sure that you've got the right folks at the table? Oftentimes we talk about these folks as stakeholders. And with us, there's a real emphasis on how you're engaging those folks who are most impacted by health disparities as experts within this process. The next one is going to be dialogue. So how are you able to actually engage in conversations with your cross-sector partners? 
that's able to not just duplicate what's already happening, but is able to consider the hard trade-offs and choices that you need to make to get to the results that you want to see. And then the next one is how do you make sure that this isn't just all talk and no action, but how does this become something that actually turns into things uh, that people can see in their communities? And from that, on the next piece, how do you continue uh, to go through an iterative process that allows you to learn from the data that you're collecting to be able to better create strategies that are going to work as interventions for your community? Throughout all of this is the next one, which is culture of collaboration, which is this, uh, uh, well, I guess actually the next one is results. So at the center of this is always thinking about what are our desired results and the reassessment of them to drive the community learning process. And then that is then um, supported by the culture of collaboration, this last one. Which we oftentimes think about this in terms of a container you may have a number of partners, you may have um, cross-sector partnerships, but what's actually the piece that holds it all together so that it's sustainable, whether or not one person leaves an organization or had access to that data or something like that, how are we able to make sure that this is sustainable over time through this iterative process? So knowing this, this is the general model we use. If you go to the next slide, for this mentorship in particular, we focus on tools in, in particular in these three areas. Um, from the beginning, are you making sure that you have the right folks at the table, that there's trust there to do data sharing? That next piece, we, we help specifically with helping diverse groups think about how they talk about data and get to a result statement and indicators that can measure their progress towards those. And then how does that translate into a learning process? And you'll see through here that um, I think what makes us a little bit different from some of the other mentors is that our focus is really on the connective tissue around data collection and analysis uh, so that you've got the pieces with the relationships of people around that that makes it into something that can turn into action. What this does is it makes us a good fit for folks who might be early on in their process, who need to build up some of these basic building blocks before they're ready for some sort of data infrastructure. But it also makes us a good fit for people who maybe have existing tools or platforms, but they're not being utilized in the way that they imagined and would like help with thinking about how to really implement them with the people in their community. So that's, that's uh, who would be a good fit for us. And then next I'll talk about a couple of examples from just our last session with mentees. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. The first one is going to be from United Way of Greenwood. They came to us with already a, an emerging plan around developing a data dashboard. And actually pretty early on, we're successful in completing um, building that data dashboard. However, due to the pandemic, things got placed on hold because they had a community that was very, very used to meeting in person and had a lot of apprehension. Well, without wanting to put that um, incredible resource to waste, what we worked on with this mentee was thinking about ways to translate what is the best version of collaboration in an in-person environment into an online environment. So something that we worked with was tools even for using simple free hacks like using a, a set of Google Slides to create a meeting whiteboard that you could use to help to prioritize items, view data, interact with data, all those types of things. For the next one, um, Laura was in a unique position where she was hired uh, between two entities, Cornell, University and Cayuga Medical Center. And she was tasked with building relationships between entities throughout these two institutions and communities to use data to get to health equity outcomes, right? So one of the things that this mentorship provided was just the opportunity to streamline what could be a million different options for approaching that task and figuring out ways to make it um, effective through strategic 
focuses on different projects. And as you can see here, that prepared her to develop some different funding proposals that made her feel successful going into 2021. And then the last one that I'll share with you is a group from Community Health Improvement Associates. And they had a very successful hub related to substance abuse and addressing that as an issue in their area. But they are missing key partnerships with the hospital and law enforcement to be able to fill in the data gaps between um, how they saw people affected by substance use moving through that system. And so uh, what we worked on was uh, thinking strategically about what would be the interest and needs of those different partners and how to bring them into the process. So those are just a few examples of how we work with our different partners. I think that many of the men mentors already have talked about the different aspects of how we connect you, whether it's one-on-ones, webinars, additional emails, using the all-in network, things like that. Um, but again, I'd uh, be excited to work with folks who are at the beginning of their learning process or who have existing tools but need to figure out how to get them better implemented. Thanks. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Fulton, and I am with Elevate Health. Elevate Health has been, uh, is now in its second year of mentorship. Uh, through this program and has been working with RWJF and partners for a fair bit longer than that as well. So we wanted to share some information about this. If you could move to the next slide, please. So Elevate Health began in 2017 as Pierce County Accountable Community of Health. Um, we're one of nine ACHs, Accountable Communities of Health, uh, within the state of Washington, and we focus on Pierce County. So although we were established as part of the uh, Medicaid waiver in 2017, uh, we have grown and I think built on that ori original mission. So that our mission is now to build and drive community coalitions that transform health systems and advance whole person health for all. So we have healthcare uh, transformation and innovation very much built into our DNA um, and several different strategies for approaching that. Our vision is that every person in every community we serve lives a full, healthy, and vibrant life. And we are very much focused on health equity as part of that whole person health for all. If we could move to the next slide, please. As those of you who work within healthcare transformation know, it's not an easy job. Um, it requires many different strategies and can end up looking fairly complex in order to actually move the needle on, on addressing uh, whole person health. So our different strategies include partnerships, data, innovations, investments, and our care continuum network, which is all about care coordination. Um, many of the other mentors also address certain pieces of this, in, including the data part. So we have a, a data collective, uh, which is really focused on how to build a community asset around data, for example. Um, and we do some innovations work, which includes work like value-based purchasing arrangements um, and other kind of healthcare innovations. But the parts that we really wanted to focus on and the areas that, that we want to sort of differentiate for the purpose of, of this mentorship are really the two aspects of our care continuum network and our investments. So the care continuum network is all about care coordination it has three primary programs within it. Our community health action teams, which serve individuals with complex medical and mental health conditions, and one that includes going out to meet people wherever they are, including on the streets. Um, they have a Pathways Hub, which is an evidence-based model for vulnerable and underserved populations. Uh, this model identifies specific social and health needs, which are called Pathways. And it supports clients to prioritize them and to address those needs. And then finally, its third program is called Health Homes, which some of you may be aware of. Um, this is for the most at-risk residents connecting to long-term care. And Elevate Health is a Health Homes lead uh, for the state of Washington. So we don't deliver these services ourselves, but instead we work with contracted partners and with their community health workers to really ensure that we're closing that gap around care coordination 
um, and to make sure that we can help address social support needs as well as healthcare needs. And that's our care continuum work, which will be one area of focus of our mentorship. The second area of focus is around investments. And my role in particular is actually as director of One Pierce Community Resiliency Fund. This is our investment arm of Elevate Health. And this is the part that funds community assets and services in the community to help build up the infrastructure that can improve health later down the line. So we focus in particular on building affordable and supportive housing, on improving access to behavioral health care, and on workforce development, particularly within the healthcare space. But we have a model which is very similar to local wellness funds that you may have heard about, um, and is all about blending and braiding different sources of capital. And in fact, within 2020, we just um, approved about four and a half million dollars of capital going to different organizations in our community. And we're able to grow the public funding we have, as well as private dollars and philanthropic dollars through our community resiliency funds. If we can move to the next slide, please. So our mentor team is going to be four or five of our Elevate Health colleagues on this team. Um, first of all is Alicia Fehrenbacher, who's our president and CEO and the sort of visionary for this specific model. Uh, the day-to-day -day will be led by John Levi, who's our community engagement specialist, who also works on our diversity and inclusion programs, which we're trying to infuse throughout all of our different strategies. And then we have um, myself working on the investment side and my colleague Kim Bjorn, the clinical director of the Care Continuum Network, as two subject matter experts around the investment and the care coordination side to support any of the mentees that we work with who want to focus on one of those specific areas. We will also be bringing on more people as needed depending on what our mentees specific areas of interest are. Next slide. So our learning objectives for 2021. Um, first of all, learning about all the core components of a successful ACH model and how integrated structure guides these different strategies. Secondly, to focus on planning, designing, or building a local care continuum network to address social determinants of health and making sure that we bring care coordination into this. And then third, taking those initial steps to blend and braid funding through a community fund. So if these are objectives that you feel your organization would benefit from learning about, um, or if these are things that you're already kind of on the path to doing, but you would like to learn more about, um, then this is the type of thing that we can help you with. And last slide, please. A little bit about our 2020 experience. Of course, as everyone's mentioned, 2020 was fairly different um, as these things go. Uh, but we did have mentees who were able to uh, produce deliverables as part of their work plans. One of them produced a wellness fund business plan and was able to get the go ahead from local partners to, to move forward with this fund plan. Uh, and second one was planning and hosting focus groups on storytelling for systems change. And that was bringing in a little bit more of our, our data work, uh, which will be a bit less of a focus this year. And then the third one was around connecting clients with health and social supports. And that's more around care coordination again, and how do we build that system that can support um, coordinating both health and social supports. We share different materials within with all of our mentees. Um, we talk a lot about the ACH funding model, about the different strategies and how they all fit together. Uh, we've also done particular presentations on designing a funding resource in the local wellness funds. And finally, we've also spoken to our mentees in this last round about data and sustainable funding and thinking about how you can use wellness funds and other types of funding um, to make sure that your model is sustained into the future. And then finally, the, the feedback from our, our 2020 cohort for this coming year um, was that they their, that particular cohort really enjoyed getting together and being able to share their own learnings between each other as well. And so some of our work plan for this year is going to allow for more opportunities to have cross cohort webinars um, where we can check in and dive a little bit deeper into some of the challenges that individual mentees might be experiencing um, so that they can benefit from the entire mentee cohort and not just not just be speaking to Elevate Health all the time. 
but we do have one-on-ones and uh, we certainly have the good feedback that we go deep in those one-on-ones and we're able to sort of provide a lot of resources and materials and support to particular mentees uh, who have projects that fit within these, these bounds. So we're very excited to, to work with new mentees this year and we hope that you'll apply. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, this is Bob Braddock. I'm from Pittsburgh at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm going to introduce you to Team Pennsylvania. This year in the mentorship, I'm going to be partnering with Drexel University's Urban Health Collaborative, and I'm, I'm here today with Erica Gilliam. And today also we have a mentee from my cohort this year, um, Ravi Venkatraman um, from the town of Richmond in Vermont to tell a little bit about his story. So in the chat, you're free to share your creepiest puppet or your favorite mascot here. We're represented by Lady Elaine Fairchild uh, from Pittsburgh where Mr. Rogers was and um, Gritty in Philadelphia needs no introduction. So next slide. So I am at the University of Pittsburgh and there I manage a project called the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center, which is a shared open data collaboration between the city, the county and my university. Um, and so we provide data infrastructure to a lot of different community projects and government organizations. We build tools out of that data and there you can see a picture of our asset map that we built for census outreach this year and then um, the pandemic hit. So. Uh, Good luck with that. And then um, we also do a lot of work with data literacy, a lot of hands-on approaches and even virtual kind of trying to engage people in all sorts of different ways. And then we also do a lot with data ecosystems. And our friends at Drexel um, also do a lot of really great work too. And I'm gonna introduce Erica. Next slide. Uh, so hi, so I am um, over at Drexel uh, as part of the West Philly Promise Neighborhood in our Urban Health Collaborative and um, some of the key work that we do is to engage community based organizations and community residents in designing and collecting data. Um, we find that by doing that we improve um, our validity as well as establish co ownership. Um, we create um, a variety of tools and resources uh, that make data more accessible. Things like we've created dashboards, community issue briefs, um, presentations, and social media posts. And over on your right is just an example. At the top is our data dashboard, that one of the data dashboards that we created, as well as some um, draft issue briefs. Um, we have a variety of partners that we disseminate data to, including community leaders, um, neighborhood organizations, city agencies, and as well as nonprofit staff. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. So um, this might be right for you if you're looking for um, you're looking to develop or strengthen data sharing collaborations or deepen your focus on racial equity and racial justice, identify and visualize data to create change, use data to support community organizing and advocacy, create or buy tools and infrastructure for public data, build community data literacy, or elevate organizational data capacity. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, you're muted. Yep, got it. Uh, thanks. Here's what to expect. So we're going to start with a work plan. And this is really a one or two page kind of Word doc that you can plug things into boxes and we can start working on um, what it is you want to work on. And, and we'll cover group activities. We might do some things together. Um, but the core of the work over the first two years of mentorship has been one-on-one -on -one consultations. And Ravi can talk a little bit about that, where we've gotten together with mentees um, once or twice a month just to kind of keep making progress on that work plan. So next slide. And so I'm gonna tell you in these next slides, just these are some of the things that the mentorships have done in the first few years. Um, worked on a lot of data literacy programs, especially in um, year one. Um, so Eau Claire, Wisconsin was one that really kind of came up with a really super creative way to engage their staff and get their staff to start talking about data. Uh, they weren't all that confident in it. So they built a, an American flag out of Hershey Kisses and asked the staff to actually, if they wanted a piece of candy, they had to 
respond to one of the prompts um, and put that in the place of the candy that they took. So it's kind of a neat way to engage staff in a really non-scary way uh, to get them more data literate. We also did um, work with Jersey City and they did a really great workbook and a series of activities to engage their staff uh, as well. And so the next example is going to be building data collaborations. We worked in a, with a group in southern Mississippi um, to really just engage their community in all sorts of ways with prompts and, and other activities um, to get a sense of what they wanted to do with data and then help them organize focus groups and community meetings. And then the, the final collaboration before I hand it off to Ravi. Um, next slide, please is just ecosystem mapping, really helping organizations and mentees and the mentorship get a sense of kind of where they fit and what relationships they could leverage or what relationships they could build in their own data ecosystem. And one example of the community that did that this time was up in Vermont, in Richmond. So take it away, Ravi. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so I'm Ravi Vingatraman. I'm the town planner for the town of Richmond. Uh, Richmond, it's a rural suburban town of about 4,000 right outside Burlington, Vermont. Uh, the DASH grant work in Richmond was entirely community driven. A community member applied for the grant in partnership with Rise Vermont, a local public health partner focused on implementing the CDC strategies for reducing obesity. Uh, another community member led the DASH grant work. Uh, so more about this work. Uh, the town has a list of goals that we aim to implement with community partners within eight years. We knew that community partners were involved in addressing these goals, but we didn't know which groups were addressing which goals, whether they had the capacity to achieve these goals, whether community members knew how to access these resources provided by partner organizations. As a small town, we have a number of community members providing resources on an informal basis. Uh, community members don't know about many of these resources because it's not advertised. There's no website or Facebook page for these resources. It's all through word of mouth. Uh, people meet in like the grocery store and they talk about these community resources that are informal in town. Um, so going in, we knew that our work had two tasks. Um, one was to survey the community and see what community members were looking for and what information they were lacking. We had the hypothesis that uh, information was severely lacking and um, information needed to be mapped out. And so that way the community could see where resources were and, and how they could access those resources. Uh, we surveyed the community and um, our survey had some issues due to COVID. We weren't able to get as much outreach, but uh, we were able to get enough uh, data and feedback to support our hypothesis that there are barriers to these local services, formal and informal. Um, and the second part of our project was how do we present this information in a legible manner? Um, and so the next slide. Uh, so we, So how we did it, was we put together an air table um, with, by linking the, the specific town goals with the resources that address those goals um, and with some notes on whether they had capacity issues and, and how far um, of an extent that, uh, that service provides. Uh, we met with Bob on a weekly basis to get a better understanding of how to approach the work. Uh, I don't have a public health background. Uh, the community members have a, have a public health background, but they're still pretty new to this type of work. So uh, Bob's help with our project was invaluable. Uh, Bob also gave us resources with other uh, DASH grant mentees so uh, we could get a better understanding of how to present our work and how to approach our work. Um, and we got access to, to workshops and webinars to, to meet up with other mentees to get a better understanding of how to do this work ourselves uh, going in. Uh, so the next phase with our work, we're hoping to use all this data and present it to the community so that way they have access to, um, to all this data in a legible manner. Uh, that would involve uh, communication through town boards and committee committees um, and also upgrading the town website so that way the information is, is much uh, more readable. Uh, thanks for your time uh, and feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Trace. I'm Director of Social Innovation at United Way Worldwide and representing the United Way 211 and Innovation teams today. Um, our cohort is really four United Ways around operationalizing data sharing and care coordination. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. 
Um, so these green dots here represent our mapping of some of the various data sharing projects that Inaiways are partnering on. And we know that in every community, data sharing is really taking on different forms, um, focusing on different key outcomes in the health, financial stability, food access, housing arenas, and that Inaiways are really playing different roles, be it convening um, or seeking to leverage 211 and figure out the role for that. And so really what all these collaboratives have in common across the United Ways though, is that primary drive to seek greater, more efficient impact for individuals in communities and really helping to coordinate that care. And that helps us to achieve our mission around fighting for the health, education, financial stability of every person in every community. Um, so we see data sharing collaboratives as really pushing the future of United Ways impact work and, seek, and so through this, we really seek to nurture United Ways who are engaging in that through the DASH experience. Next, please. Next slide. Um, so our focus, while, while I mentioned we're taking different forms and we're addressing different impact issues, what we've noticed is that United Ways experience a lot of the same pain points. And so what if we could work together and try to address some of these common challenges and build efficiencies and identify promising models for United Ways, particularly as it relates to 211 especially. Um, we know United Ways are being approached by healthcare providers um, and others to, to take on backbone convening roles in this space. We know that United Ways are being approached to share 211 resource data for these types of data sharing partnerships. And so um, how can we navigate our role together so we can build that buy-in, so we can map it to what the modern United Way looks like and how we engage in this space um, around that. And how, how could we leverage 211 for earned revenue opportunities? How do we get partners on board? And then really fundamentally, how do we apply an equity lens throughout everything we do as we set up data sharing partnerships for success? Next, please. So to get a sense of last year, we our structure of a cohort was alternating. We met every month in some capacity. We did uh, one-on-ones, and then we alternated with full group meetups, and we took deep dives on various topics that we facilitated conversation around. So this gives you a sense of some of those full group meetups that we did and topics we discussed from stakeholder buy-in, earned revenue and business models, and then collaborating with 211 San Diego on a collaborative governance and community voice webinar. Um, we're able to really find those common pain points and work through those together in addition to the one-on-one -on -one coaching. Next, please. So I just wanted to show a couple examples of mentee successes. So this first is an infographic from Northern Shenandoah Valley, which is a, a very small community in uh, Northern Virginia that uh, their primary goal going into the year was really to increase partner engagement on their data sharing collaborative to have cross agency referrals. And so they developed a monthly communications plan. And this infographic really tells a story of one community member who uh, you see the, the three different touch points that they had and how quickly they were able in less than 90 minutes to collaborate with three agencies to really help this person uh, get the, the services that they needed. And so um, they were really able through the, the year to expand their target goal was to have 50, 50 interagency referrals and they hit more than 200 by the end. So their, their techniques and um, attempts through this, this uh, mentorship were really successful in helping to meet their goals. Um, next. United of Greater Kansas City was able to um, work with the KC Common Good Partnership to develop actually a, a working governance document uh, as they're working together to really address the root causes of violence So for, for youth. So this was a really helpful application for them um, during the DASH mentorship to actually get to a point where they had a working governance document with a couple partners locally. And finally, next please. Um, we really loved working with Greater Twin Cities and we're happy to have James Collins. He'll share, uh, he's the director of 211 at Greater Twin Cities and he's gonna share a perspective next. But uh, working with them through the mentorship was really nice to see kind of how they evolved their role and thinking about how they leveraged 211. And so at our last session, they shared this abacus 
of how they are thinking about evolving 211 um, and where they are at any moment in time on their, on their journey to becoming much more proactive in sharing um, and using the 211 resources and capabilities to maximize their impact. So with that, we can go to the next slide and I'm gonna hand it over to James to share a little perspective on what he got out of the mentorship and um, lessons learned and any advice you might have. Well, thanks, Megan. And um, no, it was such a, um, and I don't know what the right word is, but it was such a, um, I want to say privilege, but that doesn't feel right. It would, if it was so nice to be part of this, uh, this mentee partner, the mentee mentor partnership, because it provided such um, kind of a safe, affirming space to ask those questions um, and share perspectives. I think um, what this really offered me and one of my colleagues was, as Megan mentioned, um, two on ones across the country are being approached all the time by so many different actors, whether it be state and local government or um, technology companies or healthcare organizations that are really um, hungry for um, some of what two on one can offer, either in its resource database or um, in the infrastructure we have of just connecting people to information with an easy in an easy way, right? Um, so in speaking with um, Megan, uh, Edwin, uh, Hillary, Rachel, and then our mentor, um, the United Way at uh, Southampton, Southampton Roads um, in Virginia, they um, were so helpful in um, helping us identify um, what models were out there, um, helping us gain a better perspective of where we're at in the process. It all felt so overwhelming, right? And so our work plan was really focused on assessing where we were at, assessing what assets we have to bring to the table um, and really developing an approach and perspective of saying, you know, this is kind of who we are, this is what we have to offer and this is what we're in it for. Really kind of for those United Way reasons of advancing, um, you know, equitable health outcomes, advancing um, economic opportunity and, um, really uh, creating pathways to prosperity in our, in our region. So um, Megan and team through this partnership helped us make sense of, um, again, what we have, what we bring to the table, what we can do. Um, they gave us advice on who to talk to, what collaborations exist, who are other um, folks around the country doing this work who could offer feedback perspective. And again, that safe space to say, okay, this is what we learned and this is where we messed up. And um, this is how we might be able to um, work together to advance kind of a shared mission uh, across the country. And almost those um, questions in the beginning, it was much more of a conversation of like, what do I not know that I don't know? Um, and then it evolved into a real partnership of um, kind of, this is what we have, I think, um, this is where we're headed. This is where we, where we are going to end up. Um, that motivation was really helpful and it built so much confidence that has already started to pay off in conversations with local healthcare providers, technology organizations, and state and local government as we really um, kind of set to slide our way across the abacus, I suppose. But. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, James. Um, you can go to the next slide. Really appreciate hearing your perspective on that. And, uh, you know, we'll be in touch. That's the beautiful thing about the United Way Network. We get to continue to work together um, even after the one year uh, mentorship over. So just to, to wrap up, uh, we bring a lot to the table in terms of United Way Worldwide's innovation team and United Way's two on one team. Um, the United Way Network, uh, James mentioned talking to peers within, um, and we have found some coaches from local United Ways that are further along in their work who we brought in for guest perspectives and support and technical assistance. So um, really looking to support you on this journey and whether that's getting started because, so Anna had started by saying that there's a couple slots for those that may not be ready to have multiple partner organizations submitting at the same time. There are a few slots in this mentorship if you're a United Way that's just not quite ready. 
So that's an option, um, but we're really focused as the mentorship is on accelerating those partnerships for communities that are ready to work together. Um, and so I will wrap it up there, but we're looking forward to a good year next year. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks to all the mentors for those great presentations that really help walk us through the various experiences of your programs and also the, the overlap. Um, it's a really solid set of expertise among all the mentors. And thanks to Ravi and James also for providing your insights as uh, mentees this year. So um, we have about 10 minutes left. We've gotten a bunch of questions in the chat and the Q&A. I just want to share that some of the questions are pretty specific, so we might be addressing those um, in the FAQs because we might not have time to get to all of them right now. Um, we'll do our best to get through most of them. So um, Miriam and Natrina are going to elevate questions for me because they've been organizing them and tracking them on behind the scenes. I, I did want to go ahead and address that question that has come up a couple times about um, using what to use the money for. Miriam pointed you to the program brochure that addresses that, but it's, it's up to your discretion. We expect that the money is split between the partners so that it helps to cover staff time for the various organizations participating, but it can also go towards um, participation in national conferences like the CIE Summit, um, CSH hosts a conference, as well as Civ Civic Canopy, um, so you can use it for that. You can also use it for community member participation incentives, um, but really it's your discretion at, as per advancing the work plan that you've outlined for the program. Um, so with that, I think Miriam and Susan, you're welcome, or um, Natrina, you're welcome to come up and just um, pose a couple questions that you think we should start with for the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, let's start with this one. Um, it The question is, what would you estimate the percentage of resources, so staffing, financial support, um, is this data sharing effort in relation to your overall program? Hmm, that's a great question. And I think from what I've heard of the men, it's gonna be different for every mentee um, and each mentor, but it, it's very much, you know, you get, you get out what you put in this year, a lot of mentees had maybe a little more limited bandwidth due to their COVID response participation. Um, I don't think we accept, expect that it's a large scope of work for your overall agency, but it might be tied to initiatives that, you're, um, that you already have funded under other grant programs, or it might be aligning some of that work together. Um, so yeah, it, that, that's the best way to kind of address that. And we can also post it in the FAQs. And so related to that, um, what time commitment can mentees expect from the mentors and how much time is needed among their own staff to dedicate to this partnership? Yeah, so I think um, all of the mentors really make themselves available um, at your disposal. So there's the general kind of pace is what um, I believe it was Megan had just addressed where there's like one-to-one -one calls with your mentor. They might be bi-monthly, they might be monthly. Um, and that's kind of interspersed with either online learning activities and trainings or with cohort calls and convenings that you do together with the other mentees. The mentor and mentees together really decide at the start of the program on what's gonna work best for the group. Some mentees, make additional requests of the mentor. And as far as I know, mentors make themselves available for additional um, time. A lot of them put in, you know, in kind of hours to be of assistance to you. So it really depends on how much you have to, to give from your staff. Great. Um, let's see, how about um, this question? Are mentees available, uh, able to reach out to mentors to further discuss fit? after today's webinar? I think it would be best to direct those questions to us and then we will, that way if there are other folks that have similar questions applying for the same program, we can kind of be the clearing house to address those. So that would be the preferences that um, you reach out to the MPO with those questions for the mentors, we'll make sure that they respond and then we'll put it into the collective FAQ. Thank you. Okay, um, so this is a little bit more um, complex of a question. 
can, can you apply if you are working on behalf of a community? So in other words, if I am a consultant working with a community who will be implementing a community data sharing network. So the application is really about the organizations that are coming together. So if you're working on behalf of the lead organization or one of the partner applications um, and can make a case for that, I think it could work. We don't fund individuals. So if, you, you know, if you're really working as a consultant that's kind of operating separately, the idea is that each of the organizations you know, is part of a collaboration. It might be a new collaboration. It might be an existing collaboration. But it's about building capacity of that entity to partner with the other group, to engage community members, um, to think about the data system. So it's not really kind of a one-to-one -one, um, mentorship to like develop one person's capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. So this one is um, a question related to um, San Diego 211. And the, the question was, will you provide information on the technical implements of a CIE? Hmm. So Karis, can you jump in? Sure. Yeah, um, I think that's definitely something we explore. Um, we're technology agnostic where we're not necessarily recommending one type of technology platform, but we, um, in our toolkit and then in a lot of our sessions, we'll talk through what are some of the ways in which you might engage your community partners, healthcare partners and community members on what technology infrastructure to build and what are the technological, technological needs that you might be needing to explore as you build a community information exchange. So um, so yes, absolutely, that's, that's a core part of what we to discuss. Great, and I'll just add that I think um, probably San Diego 211 and the CSH mentorships are maybe for folks that might be slightly further along and thinking about what data systems or data sets you're going to leverage. You might have data sharing agreements already in place or not, um, but just from the experience that we've gleaned over the last couple of years, it seems like communities that um, are selected for those mentorships tend to be a little bit further along in their work. Okay, I think that might be might have been the last question we have time for. It's um, 59 on the hour of the hour. Great, wonderful. Well, thank thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you um, glean some new information about these mentorships and you have a better sense of um, which mentor you may be applying for. Hopefully, we'll see a lot of great applications come in, and we're really excited to get this program started next year. So thanks so much. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.